Um, good morning, everyone. On behalf of the IDA PhD Collective, welcome all to the International Conference in Ideology and Discourse Analysis 2019, titled Logics, Critical Explanation, and the Future of Critical Political Theory. We're truly excited to have you join us here for the next two days in what only promises to be a lively and engaging conversation across different fields ignited by diverse research interests and all united by the shared curiosity in critical political theory. Given this common interest that has gathered us here today, let us open this conference by asking ourselves, why do we do critical political theory? What is it about this approach to understanding the world that has brought us here today? What does it offer to the moment of unprecedented economic, social, and environmental challenges that we live today? Maybe it is better to actually start by trying to answer a supposedly simpler question. What do we mean when we say we do critical political theory? To do critical political theory is to exercise the intent of theorizing our world, doing so by the critique and analysis of the political and social components which make it. As we understand theory in this way, we try to offer diagnoses that explain the norms which we inhabit and which inhabit us. Depending on the particular strand of theory that we adhere to, we might understand these norms and the practice of critiquing them differently, whether it is from a Marxist point of view, through the economic relations, through the language games of Wittgenstein, through the theory that's construction, through the power and governance relations as signaled by Foucault, through the practice of freedom inspired by Arendt, or through the analysis of political discourse as developed by Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe. Whichever path we take, however, the common thread remains as the longing to theorize our world through critique. We cannot talk about critical political theory without mentioning the several fields adjacent to it that have impacted it. As critical theories, we are indebted to the fields of sociology and anthropology. We need also mention the close relation that we hold with philosophy. As close as a relative as a sibling would be, often the divisive line between these two fields is actually lost to an extent that we can actually refer to our own endeavor as critical political philosophy. And, obviously, we owe also a great deal to the field of history, especially those of us that understand critical political theory through a post-structuralist lens, which I think is safe to say is most of us here. The historicism engraved in our critical political endeavors signifies that we, as theorists, have sought to understand the world through its contingent and radical character. We had taken nothing and given and are careful to underscore the social and historically constructed character of our world. We do not prescribe to any grand narratives. This way of theorizing the world does not go uncontested, of course, especially from the more positivistic understanding of political science. We have found ourselves constantly quarreling with the more quantitative strand, which for some years now has held main interest by its supposed better ability to explain the world. This clash has led to many productive debates within critical theories as to how we can better our capacity to explain and evaluate the world. One of these debates has culminated in the logics approach. Let me read a quote now that sums up this debate. In the final analysis, we are not confronted with exclusive choices, either empirical theory or interpretive theory or critical theory. Rather, there is an internal dialectic in the restructuring of social and political theory. When we work through any of these moments, we discover how the others are implicated. An adequate social and political theory must be empirical, interpretative, and critical. Bernstein. This is a quote that is set right at the beginning of the logics of critical explanation in social and political theory. And this is a permanent tension upon which we as critical theorists find, find ourselves in the seemingly never ending choice between critique, interpretation, and empirics. And so we ask ourselves, how much empirical grip must a theory have? What do we lose without such a grip? How much of the nuances and the fine thread of critique is actually captured by underscoring the quantitative? Is there an adequate manner of doing political theory? Is it really about choosing one or the other, or can we truthfully pay tribute to all manners of theory as a whole? This is precisely what the logics approach sets out to achieve in the wake of this ever-present critique that we received as discourse series that we do not really explain the world, but rather just merely redescribe phenomena. This is less to ask the question of how critical approaches of discourse theory can still offer its great interpretive character while also rendering such interpretations useful for empirical research. And so, this is where the work of David Howarth and Jason Glynis enters. David and Jason set out to personalize the political discourse theory ontology of radical contingency for the purpose of critical empirical research. The logics, social, political, and phantasmatic, are constructed as analytical tools which, along with problematization, reduction, articulation, and critique, allow us as theorists to flesh out the power relations upon which the contingency and the naturalization of sedimented relations and identities rest on. 
It is in this work that we find a true testament of the effort to offer an understanding of discourse analysis that needs not lose its critical and interpretive lens in order to find itself closer to empirical analysis. This way of rendering a more gripping methodological tool within discourse analysis has, of course, not only impacted our own field of discourse theory, but it has reached international relations, anthropology, sociology, critical accountability and management, and gender studies, to name a few. The logics, the logics approach has, in its 12 years, become a key test, text in the Essex School of Discourse Analysis, which leads us back to the work of Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe. The Essex School of Discourse Analysis has, since its publication of its originary text, Hegemony and Social Strategy, in 1985, stimulated the emergence of a new post-Marxist approach to social and political analysis. Those of us that adhere to the understanding and analysis of theory that came from such an exemplary text and further elaborated by several discourse scholars in this room and not only, find the research to be set out through three dimensions that also obviously resonate with the logics approach. The empirical methodological, normative evaluation, and critical ontological. The first dimension, empirical methodological, places a strong emphasis on the discursive construction and maintenance of political ideological frontiers. And so, it critically engages with and seeks to provide alternative explanations and understandings to strands of naturalism, rational choice theory, institutionalism, and so on and so forth. The dimension of the normative evaluation tries to offer alternative justifications to those offered by, for example, liberalism, neoliberalism, libertarianism, and so on. Lastly, the critical ontological dimension entails systematically identifying and engaging with the ontological, of course, but also the epistemological and methodological presuppositions that structure both our approach and others. Here, the objective is to move the center of social and political research from the directly given objects of investigation to rather their conditions of possibility. It comes as no surprise, as I said, to see these three dimensions in the logics approach as this approach offers a critical debate with positivism and its different strands, not in a manner of negation, but as a manner of producing an alternative explanation in which both critique and empiricism can strive. The logics is also compelled to offer it, not only an alternative to hegemonic discourses, such as liberalism and neoliberalism, but it does so clearly by signaling towards the element of judgment and the role of normative and ideological critique. This approach has never claimed to be, to be empty of these aspects, but rather finds that its analytical capacity is strengthened by them. Lastly, the critical ontological dimension is ever present insofar the logics come precisely through the effort to operationalize a critical political ontology. And so, by these deeply rooted dimensions within the logics, we can see a bit more clearly as to why we engage with critical political theory. We do so not because we are set to find out clear answers, but more so because we seek to better critique our world. And in doing so, we are moved by the never ending passion for questioning. And I will now hand the floor over to Custis. Okay, uh, let us now move on to saying a few things about the history of the IDA program here at Essex and about the work we have done these past three years in the Center for Ideology and Discourse Analysis, something which sounds quite straightforward, but as you know, all putting uh, things on a paper, it's not always an easy thing to do, especially when this is something quite different from saving the world by writing 250 words in one day after reading 15 papers. Um, there are some good things though, here I didn't have to put references, and so the Essex Research and Graduate Program in Ideology and Discourse Analysis was first established in 1982 under the intellectual leadership of Ernesto Laclau. Its discourse theoretic approach takes an anti-essentialist conception of discourse as its central theoretical category and draws on a wide variety of intellectual orientations, including post-Marxist, uh, post-Marxism, psychoanalysis, post-Heideggerian phenomenology and hermeneutics, uh, and post-analytical philosophy. Discourse theory, as deployed by the IDA research program, has come to be identified with a series of thinkers such as Marx, Gramsci, Althusser, Saussure, Laclau and Mouffe, Lacan, Derrida, and Foucault. Since then, and alongside the two founding figures of the program, Ernesto Laclau and Santal Mouffe, a number of students, researchers, and scholars uh, have played an important role in significantly enriching the framework of the program. Intodological presuppositions, theoretical concepts, and methodological precepts working within a variety of research fields. Interests in the IDA research program include the broad fields of ethics, post-structuralist, post-Marxist, and psychoanalytic theories of ideology and discourse, contemporary democratic theory and governance, mass media, communication, and many more. And uh, while research and ideas around those fields have been developed in many different places across Europe, uh, UK, and elsewhere, 
uh, Essex and its IDA program has always been a meeting point for scholars, researchers and students working with this, within this approach. Some of you might remember several important debates and discussions that took place under the auspices of the Center for Theoretical Studies in the Humanities and Social Sciences, which was established in November 1990 under the initial directorship of Ernesto Laclau. Debates, presentations and discussions with leading thinkers such as Roy Baskar, Judith Butler, Joan Kopjes, William Connolly, Simon Critchley, Richard Rotary, Slavoj Zizek and others. Fast forward now to three years ago when a good number of us started our PhD here. It was really good to think, uh, uh, to find out a bit later how important it is to have a good group of people, now beloved friends, to share your research interests, thoughts and everyday life. Uh, the same year, I also vividly remember the active and enthusiastic MA cohort, Mary, Emilio, Dan, Tim, Surya, some of them are here today with us, which organized their own conference on populism in the summer of 2017, an event which some of you assisted. Um, when I got accepted for the PhD here, I started checking what's on in Essex and uh, I found nothing. And since then, <laughs> I share my depression with the rest of us. That's, for example, a good thing when you have a good number of people to share things. Uh, no jokes now, I found the IDA World website. And since that moment, I had in my mind that with a good network, you can organize several interesting events. So long story short, I remember going to David's office at some point in December 2016. Uh, with the idea to create a center or network for ideology and discourse analysis. Some meetings and months later, months later, in this time of the year, I found myself filling yellow post-its and exam answer books with ideas for the center's application form while I was invigilating. And I have one last invigilation this Thursday, so if you are applying for funding, please let me know and I will help. October 2017, we had the confirmation and the Center for Ideology and Discourse Analysis was launched with a workshop funded by the Eastern Academic uh, Research Consortium with the title Austerity, Resistance and Emergent Imaginaries from the Occupied Squares to the Parliament and the Neighborhood. It was a very interesting day with presentations and open discussions with speakers such as Marina Prendulis, Lasse Thomas and Stephen Griggs, Lazarus Karaliotas and of course Jason and David. The academic year 2017-2018 uh, was further ignited by the new, again, uh, big IDA PhD cohort, Jimena, Karin, Nuf, Claudio, among us today. Um, and we very soon had the capacity to start the SIDA seminars, uh, which, with internal and external speakers from different disciplines. And uh, we were really amazed by their quality and success in terms of attracting uh, a very big audience from the very first seminar until today. Uh, the highlight of the previous year, I think for all of us, um, was the project titled Essex Transform, Rediscovering the Demos Inside the Space of Academia, a one-month uh, student-led project with students from all the different levels of the academic community, which culminated in the main day event, which was held on the 15th of June. Uh, the day was made up of four student-led sessions with themes ranging from democratic education, solidarity with migrants and refugees, transformative art and radical democracy, to liberational feminist and queer struggles. Two panels followed with academics and activists centered on topics of university emancipation and everyday struggles and lessons of radical democracy. We closed the day uh, with a plenary session, session with uh, the participation of Yanis Tavrakakis, uh, David uh, Howarth, Jane Hindley and um, Marina Prendulis. Uh, you would think we should, uh, that we would be tired after such a busy year and uh, would want to take a break, but no. <laughs> As soon as one event is finished, even before that, we are thinking of what next can SIDA offer and thinking of whom I will sneakily trick into helping out. This time, though, I have promised not to come up with more ideas until October, so as to you know, at least Ryan and I can finish our PhDs. Uh, but I made no such promise last year. Um, and so, after the PhD collective pitched the idea to David and Jason, and David gave me two hours and 45 minutes to prepare from scratch the funding application, the idea for this conference became reality. Uh, as the events that uh, preceded, this conference is made up by the work and effort of the IDA PhD collective and uh, the MA cohort of the IDA program. Uh, we all gave our best and are truly glad to see all of you here today. The idea behind the conference, as the title reveals, started with the logics of critical explanation. However, the idea soon grew and we focused on creating a rich conference with a wider perspective on different strands of critical political theory and philosophy, not leaving aside, of course, the empirical dimensions and imports. Before we close this introduction, 
Uh, we want to thank all the IDA, MA and PhD students for all their work. David and Jason for making this possible by bringing all of us here in the first place and then showing in practice that still in UK academia in 2019, believe it or not, we can work collectively practicing a truly radical democratic ethos, something we are not alone in. The discourse theory network is growing more and more all these years. We still remember the great work of the Populismus Research Project in the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, the continuation of which can be found today in the very active circle for the study of populism. The memories from the amazing conference in Brussels, organized by the Desire team, Benjamin, Jana, Nico, are still fresh. And we are very happy that we have started to establish a wider research network for discourse theory and discourse analysis altogether. We also want to thank the admin team of our department, Kimberly, Emma, Elliot and Jamie for all their help and support, especially since we took the decision to organize everything on our own without outsourcing things, and that meant more work for them. Uh, a, special, a special shout out to Elliot, our fin finance the, uh, admin, who suffered the most, having me and Jimena almost every day in his office. Many thanks, Elliot. We also want to thank our creative partner, Artworks, Graphics and Design, for all the amazing work. Safe to say this is one of the most creative conference materials you have seen. <laughs> we must also say that this conference would not have been possible without the funding from the Economic and Social Research Council. Lastly, a huge thank you to our keynote and plenary speakers. We are truly grateful and humbled that you agreed to participate in our conference. Today at 5.30 p.m. we are honored uh, to launch the Ernesto Laclau uh, lecture series with Santal Mouf, who will deliver the inaugural lecture. Following that, and during our wine reception, Nico Carpentier will present the latest published work by the Brussels Discourse Theory Group titled Communication and Discourse Theory, edited by Lynn Van Prussel, Nico Carpentier and Benjamin Declin. Tomorrow, we are very excited to have uh, Jody Dean for our second keynote at 1.30 p.m. Uh, at 5 p.m., David Howarth and Jason Vilnos will offer the third keynote upon which they will reflect on the 12 years of the logics, the challenges it has faced, and future direction and trajectories. Immediately after, a closing plenary will follow with Karen West, Jenny Gunnarsson Payne, and Hugh Wilmot, who will offer reflections upon critical theory in relation to more empirical applications in different research fields. Uh, to not let you watch the Champions League final tomorrow night, we have arranged our social event with open buffet and drinks in the Secret Garden at 7.30, uh, which may or may not have a screen to stream the match. Uh, so, once again, thank you all for uh, being here. We are sure that we will have a great conference, but also great times to remember. And uh, we would now like to introduce Professor Moja Lloyd, our Executive Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences. Professor Lloyd is a theorist herself and has particular interest in gender and feminist and radical democratic theory. More recently, her research has explored questions of heteronormative violence, the politics of grievability, and the politics of the human. She has published two monographs, Beyond Identity Politics and Judith Butler from Norms to Politics. Uh, without further ado, we hand the floor to Professor Lloyd to officially kickstart our conference. I think I might know how to put a microphone on by now. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and for uh, the opportunity to, to come here today uh, and to, to open the conference. I'm, I'm going to do it with two hats. Um, firstly, as, as um, Koss has just mentioned, I'm the um, Executive Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences here. I joined the institution in October, so I'm relatively new to the role. Um, and it's a great privilege for me to open this conference, both as the executive dean, but also as a political theorist. And I'll say a bit more about that later on. Um, but I'm doing this on behalf, the, little, the first bit is on behalf of the, uh, of the faculty and the university, if you like. Um, but one of the joys of the job is actually getting the chance to go around the institution to different events and to listen to the kinds of research, the cutting edge research that is undertaken both by our own scholars at Essex um, but also visitors who come to conferences here. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to, to 
being at least able to sort of listen to some things later on uh, today. I wanted to just give you a sense of the faculty, if I may, um, to begin with. So as I say, this is my ED hat on. It's the largest faculty in the university, um, some 600 staff and 6,000 students. And it has an outstanding international research reputation. Um, it's in the top four of all universities for social science in research terms, and in the top 50 for social science in the Times Higher World University rankings. It's a large faculty, and it comprises eight departments. EBS, the, uh, the Essex Business School, which is where we're located today. The departments of economics and sociology, which you might find in most um, social science faculties. We also have a department of language and linguistics and a department of psychosocial and psychoanalytic studies, which is a relatively recent incarnation. Um, we've also got, obviously, the department of government, and I'll come on to that. We, we have an institute for social and economic research, uh, and the institute is the home to a number of ESRC-funded centres, so it gets a lot of its funding from the UK research councils. It has a research centre on micro-social change, um, the UK Longitudinal Studies Centre. It hosts something called Understanding Society, uh, which is the UK Longitudinal Survey of 40,000 households, which is the largest household panel survey in the world. And it was awarded the Queen's Anniversary Prize in 2017, so it's, one of, you know, it's a very prestigious institute. We also have the UK Data Archive, which is also funded by the ESRC, um, which is the UK's biggest collection of digital research data in the social sciences and humanities. And you can access data there from census programmes and secure data service and so on. UK also co-hosts the National Administrative Data Research Network. Um, I guess more pertinent perhaps to some of you here, um, Essex is also a lead partner for, the, uh, for SENS, which is the ESRC doctoral training centre that links 10 institutions across the southeast of England. And I gather there are students here from SENS today. Um, so welcome to you all. Um, and it's also a partner in the SOCB, Social Biological uh, Centre for Doctoral Training. Um, in this case, it works with UCL and Manchester. And we've recently been successful in getting sort of additional Q-step funding um, for the, the kind of introduction and development of quantitative work for, for our students. Government department in 2013 was awarded a Regis Professorship in Political Science, and it's one of only two universities to hold a Regis Professorship in a social science subject. Government itself is ranked number one in the UK uh, in terms of research. I mean, if we have a regular research audit which ranks departments in terms of research outputs, um, income, environment, um, impact case studies, all this sort of thing. And it's been top-ranked department through almost all the cycles of, of this uh, research audit. And I guess that increasingly, it's become known for its work in political science over time. But for me, one of the hallmarks of the department, and which makes it particularly distinctive in the UK and elsewhere, is, of course, its work around discourse analysis. And as has been mentioned earlier, um, the, the department is, of course, center, uh, uh, of host sorry, to the Interdisciplinary Centre for Ideology and Discourse Analysis, under whose auspices this conference has been organised by the IDA PhD Collective. And this involvement, I think, of graduate students in the activities of the centre and in the activities of the department in relation to political theory is fundamental both to its operation and its success. Um, so I'd, I'd like to congratulate you all on putting this together. It looks like a fantastic programme. Right. I'm also a political theorist, and so I'm particularly happy to be here today. I mean, if you've looked at the bio of me that exists, that's in the, the document, the programme, you'll see that my PhD was in 18th and 19th century political theory and classical political economy. Um, I quickly realised, about two-thirds of the way into it, that this really wasn't the area for me, that, you know, I needed to get the PhD completed, as we all do, in a particular time frame. But that, that was it. You know, I was not going to continue with it. Um, and I was, I was at Warwick as a, as a PhD student. And Warwick was a very sort of traditional liberal political theory department. We didn't talk about race. We didn't talk about gender. We didn't talk about heteronormativity or anything like that. But I kind of knew that these were the things that, that, that interested me. And 
Initially, after I did the PhD, I thought, OK, I'm a historian of political thought. I'll do something on gender and you know, socialist thought in the 19th century. But I didn't. I got a job. And um, the job that I got brought me into contact with a group of people who had interest in something called post-structuralism, um, which I have to confess that I hadn't really heard of. Which is slightly odd if you know Warwick, because Warwick has a very strong sort of philosophy and literature department, and I was a, a politics and French student, so some of my French lecturers were part of this sort of collection. And they were all working on this stuff, but it didn't translate into teaching, and it didn't translate into the undergraduate experience. And so, in this new job, I came across this person called Michel Foucault, um, and I was bitten. And that began the sort of journey that I went on. I ended up kind of spending quite a lot of time writing about Judith Butler um, as a consequence, really, of reading Foucault and trying initially to argue that she was a Foucauldian feminist. That soon went. Um, but that kind of, those two, Foucault and Butler, I think have remained my intellectual travelling companions ever since. I have a quite, an, you know, an agonistic, antagonistic relationship with the kind of work. I'm not, I'm not an acolyte. I do kind of, I'm critical of it. But they, they, they sort of shape my thinking. Another change of job took me to Belfast, to Queen's University, where all of a sudden I was with a group of colleagues who were working on Deleuze and Guattari, Habermas, Gramsci, and Le Clau and Mouffe. Um, and it was there that I, that I encountered hegemony and socialist strategy for the first time. Now, this is the mid-90s, so I came to this quite late, really, given that the book was probably out for about 10 years by the time I got there. Um, but the book, for me, was an interesting read, it was a provocation to think differently about many of the questions that engaged me at the time. And I think it challenged many of the things that I had taken for granted or, th or thought that, that you needed to take for granted. It made me more, along with the kind of Foucault Butler stuff, I think it made me in more interested in sort of an interrogative approach to political theory. So I'm far more interested always in asking questions rather than trying to sort of devise solutions, I think, to things. From, from that point onwards, I started to read more widely around um, uh, of the work of both uh, Anessa Leclerc and Chantal Mouffe. And reading those texts helped me forge my thinking around identity, collective politics, notions of agonism, um, politics and the political, and radical democracy. And several chapters of the book uh, Beyond Identity Politics that uh, Costas mentioned earlier bear traces of these texts and ideas. Uh, particularly in the, in the account of inessential coalitions that I tried to develop in that book. The book I edited on radical democracy would never have been possible without this earlier work by Leclerc and Mouffe and others. Whilst at Queen's, I set up with another colleague a PSA specialist group on, um, uh, on post-structuralism and radical democracy. So you could see I'd really got the bug by this point. Um, and one of the roles of the group was to organise panels at the Political Studies Association's annual conference. And I have an abiding memory of a conference. Um, I think it's Glasgow, and I think it's 1996. Does that sound about right, people? But one of the... the this conference made me realise just how rich and vibrant the political theory community at Essex was. As a range of... Um, postgraduate researchers, early career researchers, along with a few more established people. I, got, I know a letter was there. I think David was there. Um, I can remember other names, but I'm not going to name check, just in case I miss somebody out. But they gave papers. And I was sitting, listening to a set of these papers with my then head of department, who was also a political theorist. And he turned to me and he said, this is what cutting-edge theory looks like. And... For me, the Essex School of Discourse Theory has become indelibly connected with cutting-edge theory and analysis. And of course, this includes David and Jason's book, Logics of Critical Explanation in Social and Political Theory, um, which seeks to set out a theory of critical explanation centred around logics. And as one reviewer notes, the book presents the first systematic and sustained application of post-structuralist insights to, critical, to a critical analysis of the nature of explanation method. And like hegemony and socialist strategy, logics has prompted a new generation of scholars to think differently about questions, problems, and topics in political theory, but also in other areas and disciplines. And I think 
Looking through the programme for the conference, what strikes me is the I mean, richness and diversity of the topics and themes being covered. You know, visual culture, uh, the gilets jaunes, capitalism, the logic of markets, gender, a huge range of things. But it's the breadth of theoretical positions being engaged with and or deployed. You know, Le Clan Mouffe, um, Howarth and Glenos, but also, you know, Zizek, Badieu, and others. But I think it's also the truly international reach of the discussions that are taking place around these topics um, and in these fields of inquiry. I'm sure the conference will provide a productive space um, for engaged conversation and debate around its core themes of critical empirical analysis and political discourse. I mean, I thought the questions that you, that you opened with were really suggestive, Imona, of, you know, as a, as a kind of prompt to thinking for, for the next few days. I'm looking forward to listening to more cutting-edge research, so there's no pressure there, anybody. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you, and have a great conference. <laughs>